Dramatic change in Egypt as the government allows the currency to float and interest rates to rise. Will this be enough to reset the struggling Egyptian economy? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. Egypt is the most populous Arab country and has always played a central role in Middle Eastern politics. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was elected president in May of 2014, almost a year after he removed his predecessor, President Mohamed Morsi, from office in a coup. Many Egyptians believe Mr. al-Sisi would bring stability to a country in upheaval after the turbulence of the Arab Spring that swept the region in 2011. Insight Sarah Firth investigates the state of Egypt today and whether the country has simply traded one dictator for another. Tahrir Square, Cairo, 2011. <laughs> the Egyptian revolution has taken grip and the air is filled with chants of rage and hope. Freedom, justice, with dignity. These were the main things that people were thinking about and calling for. There was a lot of fear, but a lot of courage at the same time. Because there was so much hope. There were so many people out there. You felt the strength of the people on the street. 18 days later, and it's announced President Hosni Mubarak will step down. A victory for the millions of Egyptians who had taken to the streets and what was hailed as the beginning of a new chapter for the Arab world's most populous country. But since then, there's been little respite for a dissatisfied population. People are complaining about not finding sugar, rice and oil, very basic staple items, food items in stores. And this is an up upscale um, neighborhoods in Cairo. Uh, you, you can only imagine how it's like the poorer sectors of society. That discontent was captured recently in the ranting of a tuk-tuk driver that went viral. We watch TV, we find Egypt's like Vienna, he says. We go to the streets, it's like Somalia's cousin. The video was quickly censored. It's this picture portrayed in glossy tourism board videos that the country's regimes have preferred. <music> Under Sisi, authoritarian rule has continued and anyone who speaks out against Egypt's authorities is at risk. That's according to human rights organizations who warn that since the election of President Sisi, the Interior Ministry has used counter-terrorism as an excuse to kidnap citizens, torture them, and subject them to periods of enforced disappearance. People like Noor, who along with his brother Islam, was detained by the National Security Agency and interrogated. Noor's brother wouldn't be released for 122 days. We didn't know anything about him during this period. He was subjected to the worst kinds of torture you can imagine, whether electrocuted or hanging him from both his arms and legs. But Western leaders have been notably muted on these recent issues. Today and half a decade of turmoil later, and the UK government, along with the US and many European governments, have renewed arms shipments to Egypt and given pretty significant economic assistance and assurances. There might be mounting evidence of a serious crackdown under President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, but for many Western leaders when it comes to Egypt, it's back to business as usual. It's perhaps not surprising. Egypt has long been considered one of the most important players in the Middle East, seen by many people as a powerful and balancing voice in the Arab world. The uprising and counter-revolution have led many to assert that perhaps Egypt wasn't ready for democracy. That's a very orientalist take on the region to say the region is an, 
we had a, we had an election, and then there was a coup. So, um, and the coup was supported by, as I said, non-democratic forces. And to some extent, um, Western governments have been silent in some the suppression that's been taking place. We had 40,000 people who were actually imprisoned by Sisi. So, uh, we had a, a process, a democratic process, which was reversed by so-called democracies and anti-democratic forces within the region, particularly the Gulf countries, who who, who funneled in, you know, billions and billions of pounds to actually underwrite. Uh, at the queue. So um, it's, there are considerations which is other than democracy and the freedom of the people, and these considerations are most likely to with uh, the, the, the regional security, uh, but the security without freedom and prosperity is not sustainable. In Egypt right now, an unsustainable division remains. Another regime that so far refused to countenance any genuine change and a young, well-educated population that won't settle for anything less. The accumulating grievances are dangerous for Egypt's current leader. The talk of another revolution remains below the surface for now. Sarah Firth, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Dr. H.A. Hellyer, who's an associate fellow at international security at the think tank, the Royal United Services Institute. He's also the author behind the book, A Revolution Undone, Egypt's Road Beyond Revolt, uh, which we'll talk to Dr. Hellyer in just a moment. But let's concentrate, if we may, on the economics of this announcement, which came out as we started our conversation. Um, to make a currency change was, I think, inevitable. It was on the agenda. The IMF has suggested that was needed. But to float freely, that's quite a measure they've introduced. It's quite bold. It's quite bold. Um, now, the IMF has already stipulated um, that before it actually considers um, going forward the loan, there's got to be moves on currency devaluation. Um, and the, the hint was is that eventually a currency float uh, would be the best way forward. But very few in Egypt actually expected that a full float was actually going to take place in at least the near future. Currency devaluation would have, uh, was entirely expected and has been expected for weeks. Um, this morning, that's obviously changed. Um, the government has taken the step. Um, it's a free float. It's a completely free float. Um, and we shall see how the market is going to respond to that. Um, the, the fear is that prices will rise. Uh, interest rates have already gone up. Um, all of these things are necessary, I have to emphasize here. Um, the, the structure of the Egyptian economy um, has been in a very bad state for a very long time, and a number of reforms are indeed quite necessary um, and have been necessary for a long while. The question is, is now what happens as a result? Politicians can see that. Um, mm. Economists can see that. A population never likes their indeed, cost of living of going down. How will the population react? Do you well, we, d uh, we don't know. So uh, here's part of the issue. Um, we are now in, uh, in the winter. It's November. Um, this is probably the least bad time to do something like this because energy uh, demands are lower than they would be than, for example, in the summer. Um, Ramadan is in the summer, which is the most expensive month of the year in a place like Egypt. So this is probably the best time to do it. But still, you're going to see prices increase inevitably as a result of all of this. Um, and the question remains, how is the population going to be able to adapt to it? And keeping in mind, we still have uh, the expectation that subsidy reform is also going to take place, which again will hit that population. Uh, the dollar, of course, was almost ha having a, a heyday, wasn't it, in recent weeks? That may be has, in the black uh, market. In yeah. the black market, yes. yes. There, there were two exchange rates, the unofficial and the official. Yeah. That had to be addressed because that black market was getting out of control. Wasn't well, it? the black market's been, uh, been out of control for quite some time, but over the last few days in particular, um, it's, it's really gone through the roof. Uh, the official bank rate was 8.89. Yeah. Um, the black market rate um, a couple of weeks ago was around 14, 15, um, and then hit 16, and then last week hit more than 18. Um, and then the bubble kind of burst over the last couple of days for a number of reasons. You hinted at the changes to energy charges or energy subsidies, yes. fuel subsidies. Indeed. What, just well, explain that subsidies, to us as yeah. a regular. If I'm a regular Egyptian citizen, 
I get cheap fuel at the moment, and you get, by how much do you think it needs to go so, up to be so, more realistic? So different, different subsidies exist for different types of fuel, right? Um, so there are subsidies that are across the different bands of fuel, um, and different types of fuel affect different uh, economic classes in Egypt, um, but they're all subsidized. Um, you also have basic foodstuffs that have been subsidized as well, um, including, uh, including a real staple, which is sugar. Um, and there's been a sugar shortage, as I'm sure you know, over the last few weeks. Now, um, all of this is likely to change to some degree. Now, again, it's inevitable that they do. You can't have an economy that survives on subsidies to that extent indefinitely, particularly with a population that the average, the average age of which is 24, um, around 70% or more of the population is under the age of 35. You, know, you, you, can't, con you can't constantly depend on subsidies in order to keep that afloat. The uh, social security net that exists for most Egyptians today is not particularly good, um, and one has to wonder, um, how much is being done in order to provide for the more vulnerable sections of society going forward. Um, my concern is that not enough is being done, um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the subsidy reform is necessary um, and the currency devaluation is necessary. But there is popular, unofficial and official dissent. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. They presumably don't want the current regime to succeed and will probably try and disrupt their management of well, not just the economy, of life in general. Um, your book alludes to the road back from revolt, or beyond revolt, mm. I should say. Um, the population of a lot of the Arab nations, and Egypt in particular, have got the taste for revolt and public dissent. As a result of the uprising in 2011, that a lot of exhaustion has actually set in, a lot of fatigue has set in. Uh, because if you're, if you're an average Egyptian on the street, I would argue that in 2011, you participate in a revolt, um, your revolt essentially comes to an end once, Muhammad, uh, once uh, Hosni Mubarak has been thrown out of office. Yeah. Um, and you haven't seen a lot of improvement in your day-to-day -day life. Now, that's not necessarily the result of the revolt directly. It's, uh, I would argue it's far more the result of actions that were taken after that. But that doesn't matter. If you're looking at your day-to-day -day life, how on, uh, on a very basic level you've managed to go from day-to-day, -day, then the economy isn't doing better, it's done worse. Uh, tourism has gone down. Uh, the cost of living has gone up. Uh, the value of your savings have gone down. You know, all of that is, in real terms, that is true. The reasons for that are not necessarily the result of simply a revolt. There are many things that took place after that. Um, but as a result of that, I think that you'll find that quite a lot of people um, are, are just very tired. Um, there's been a lot of turmoil over the last few years. Again, it's, it's not about whether it's justifiable or not. It's just mm -hmm. about what is. Um, and if you're, uh, uh, if you're a young person in Egypt uh, between the age of 25 and 35, then yes, you have witnessed in your very short lifetime, you have witnessed a revolt against uh, Hosni Mubarak. You've witnessed uh, the departure of Mohammed Morsi. Um, you've witnessed a lot of changes that have taken place, at least in part, due to people power. Um, but you've also not seen the dividends come from that. So the question is whether or not people would even be, want to engage in that sort, of, uh, that sort of movement again. And also keeping in mind if there's the space to do that anyway. Dr. Helia, thank you very much indeed. You're very kind. Thank you. This is Insight. Coming up, we speak to the UK's former ambassador to Egypt, James Watt, about the political and economic troubles the country is facing.